Hi, my name is Jody Fletcher. I'm currently the 2MEF Command Master Chief, and I spend a lot of time talking with sailors in groups or individually about evals. I'm going to be retiring soon, and a few folks have asked me to record the speech that I normally give uh, to groups before I go over the side. That way we can kind of capture the, you know, the lessons learned for, for anybody who wants to watch it. So a little bit of history, I've sat several different boards over the years. Uh, what I discuss is not necessarily about the board process, but my goal is to give you a different perspective on eval writing and the importance of telling your story in an eval. Everything that I say is my opinion, and it's based solely on my experience, uh, either with the boards that I've sat or just the, at this point, probably thousands of evals that I've looked at throughout the years. So looking at board packages is okay, but to me, the real difference uh, is in looking at evals. And I'm very, very passionate about that. The speech that I give or that I'm gonna talk with you about here is what I normally do when I sit down with a sailor. So if somebody asks me to look at their evals, you know, I, I ask them to send everything to me prior to our sit down. I spend about 30 to 45 minutes with their evals kind of bleed all over them. And then I schedule about an hour sit down. So I use that time and their evals to discuss what I'm about to discuss with you. So this will be a little more generic than if I were sitting down with, with you individually, but I should be able to get the same points across. I'm also going to be following a PowerPoint, which I never do, because even when I'm giving this to groups, it's kind of just, you know, uh, going off questions with the crowd and stuff like that. So you have to forgive me if I, you know, pause or, or uh, blunder a little bit here and there. And I will talk briefly about the board process at the end, because it is important, uh, uh, not the board process, but I mean the, the package process for the boards at the end, uh, because that's what people normally ask is they say, hey, will you look at my package? And of course, you know, but that takes a few minutes, whereas, looking at someone's evals is a couple hour process in total. So uh, that's what I really wanna, wanna talk about is the evals. So first things first, I have one golden rule and here it is. My number one rule is never touch an eval without reading the last five evals of that person. Again, never touch an eval without reading the previous five evals. The reason I say that is evals are like a story or they should be like a story. And this is, you know, where kind of the mistakes that I see begin to, to pile up is because we don't look at our evals like they're a story. I don't know if you've ever walked into a bookstore and seen what they call a date with a book. So it's a, a book, you know, that's wrapped up in brown paper so you don't know what it is. And then, you know, the idea is you buy that and you take it home and you don't know what you're gonna get. The, the, if I were to give you one of those books and just take out one chapter and give you the chapter from that book, would you be able to tell me what that story is about? Chances are you wouldn't. Or if I asked you to write a chapter in my book without telling you what the story is about, would you be able to do that effectively? You might write you know, a, a chapter from a spy novel and I'm writing a romance novel. The two just don't go together. So the point that I'm getting across is that when you are working on anybody's eval, whether it's yours or one of your sailors, you need to look at it as a story with five chapters. Always go back uh, and look at those five chapters because you have five chapters to tell the story of that sailor when it comes to the board. Your job in these five chapters is to paint the picture of the character in that story. So when it comes down to all of us, uh, you know, you watching or those of us that are sitting boards, we've all had experiences in the Navy. And if I was to start painting a picture of a sailor, you're naturally going to generate an image of somebody that you've worked with before. So if I say a first class petty officer who is the president of the FCPOA, always looks fantastic in their uniform, they're a CFL and, you know, they're great at their job, blah, blah, blah you're forming a mental image of somebody that you know, or perhaps you are that sailor. Our job in the storytelling, storytelling process for the evals is to paint the picture 
of the specific person that you're talking about, not the generic version that's in each of the reader's minds. The biggest mistake that we make with our evals is that we write the evals in a vacuum. If you don't read the previous evals, you're doing the story of that sailor a huge injustice because you're just writing one eval at a time. And I'll show you how that comes into play in just a minute here. So let's get into it a little bit. All right, I'm gonna to try to use my mouse here so if you can follow along. When I'm grading evals, I kind of, you know, of course we read everything and, and all of that. But one of the first steps I do is I look at the rate, the ship or the station, and then the reporting senior. If these three things are the same, then I'm in, in two evals, then I'm gonna compare the evals with each other. So if the rate, the shipper station, and the reporting senior are the same, now I'm gonna compare all of this stuff. This is my first indicator, whether or not someone has read the evals like a book or they're writing in a vacuum. Because the number one mistake I see, or one of the major mistakes I see, if you look inside this little circle here, and this is a great example because this is where I see it a lot, Block 35, and I'm using the, throughout this, this video, I'll be using the first class or, you know, E6 and below eval as an example, but it applies to uh, chief evals as well. So in block 35 here, EEO, 30, that's kind of a standard thing unless you're, you know, doing something in those areas, right? And then right below that is military bearing and character, 40. So let's say I look at this eval and, you know, read it. Then I go to the next eval in sequence and it's the same rate, the same shipper station, and the same reporting senior, now I'm comparing these two together. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen the, the rankings shift for no apparent reason. Now, we all know that when we are trying to manage the CO's RISCA, we do that by messing with the performance traits to get the correct individual trait average for that sailor. So, you know, things get moved around in blocks 33 to, I think it's 39, but this is where you've got to pay attention. And I've literally seen right here, and if you're looking at the right, block 35, they go from a 3.0 to a 4.0 in EEO, and from a 4.0 to a 3.0 in military bearing and character. Now, imagine you're that sailor when I'm debriefing your evals with you and I look up and say, so why did you have a drop in uh, military bearing and character compared to your last eval? I usually get the deer in the headlights look when that happens, right? But the reality is 99% of the time, it's because nobody's paying attention to what they're doing when they're doing all these marks. So make sure you go through and you're never dropping somebody in a performance or in a, yeah, the performance traits unless they legitimately deserve it because that can cause major problems and it just shows that you're not paying attention. All right, next, space utilization. So when we're telling our stories, space utilization is a major theme. Remember, and I'm gonna say this several times throughout, so just bear with me. These are my opinions alone, all right? My opinions based on my experience. So there's 23 lines in a, an eval to tell the sailor's story and I think about 21 in a chief's eval. Evals are meant to build on the last eval like a story, chapter to chapter to chapter. And it's a story of sustained superior performance. In that vein, block 29 is one of the most miss and underutilized spaces in, in an eval, hands down. There's several myths and I'll uh, debunk one of them here. Again, my opinion, if it's in block 29, it has to be explained in 43. 100% false, in my opinion. Don't tell me the same information twice and don't duplicate things that you've already explained in great detail in past evals. You're wasting space. Most of our sailors have a very high quality problem that they have so many good things, they can't fit it all into an eval. So why would we then continue to say the same thing over chapter after chapter? If you were reading a book and it said the same thing every single chapter, you'd put it down. If something is rate specific, and again, this is talking about block 29, it's probably more of a primary than a collateral duty. So I was a corpsman before I became a command master chief. So a lot of my examples will be in the corpsman rating. But if I'm a corpsman 
a lot of times I'll see, or I'm looking at quorum and evals, I'll see, you know, healthcare records petty officer as a collateral duty. That's not a collateral duty. That's part of their primary duties. And I say that because real collateral duties are non-rate specific. It's something that any sailor and any command can hold. So think about CFL, sponsorship, warfare qualification program management. Those types of things are legitimate collateral duties. Everything else falls under, you know, kind of that, the, uh, the grouping of primary duties. Block 29 is a great place to let the reader know you're still doing something without taking up a ton of space in block 43. And I'll explain that right here in the next slide. So this slide's a little busy, but we'll start from the left and from the top. So right here on the, in the center, don't tell me the same thing you've already told me. This is a huge mistake we see on block 29 to block 43 a lot. So over here, it usually starts off with something like LPO leads 25 junior sailors and three petty officer first classes across two departments and three regions, all that kind of stuff. Then you flip it over to the back, block 43, literally copied and pasted the exact same information. Don't do that, you're wasting space. If you've told me something over here, then when you move over to block 43, just start with LPO colon and then start telling us what your sailors have done because that's usually where we put our sailorization stats. Put that stuff in there, you know, under direct leadership, three NAMs, two Blue Jacks of the year, all that kind of stuff. You don't have to tell me how many you led, where they were, all that. You've already told me. Or over here on the left side, just say LPO, you know, dash 12 months. Then when you get over here, that's where you explain it all. But don't duplicate the information you're wasting space. Also, block 29. There are four lines in block 29. Don't waste them. So this big red uh, rectangle here indicates what I normally see is blank space. Block 29, you'll see some of the basic stuff, right? And then just a big giant blank space. So oftentimes one line or maybe even a line and a half is completely empty. We have to read block 29. You're losing, you're losing valuable space here. And I'll show you how to manage it a little bit better here in a few minutes. Um, and I was talking a little bit earlier about primary duties and collateral duties. When you're putting things in block 29, ask yourself, is this something that the reader actually needs to know or am I just trying to fill space? If you're filling space, don't put it in there. If it's something that doesn't contribute to the character development in that person's story, then don't put it in there, it's wasting space. Another little helpful, tent, uh, helpful tip, and this is really just for the board members, right? Or anybody reading a ton of evals. You know, this is where we put our deployments or TADs and all that kind of stuff, which is fantastic. That absolutely goes there. But at the end of all of those deployments or TAD, you'll see here in the parentheses, just do us a favor and kind of add all those days up. And you can, you know, show them in two different ways. 210 over 365 or 210 days total, something like that. So in one of my previous commands, one of the units within the command was a, a, shore, a shore command, right? But those sailors are always TAD. And so again, block 29 is helping set the stage for what I'm gonna read in block 43. If I'm looking at a shore sailors eval, I'm probably expecting to see certain things in block 43. But if you tell me up here, this is a shore sailor who's been TAD 210 days out of 365, now it's gonna change my frame of reference for block 43. When I start reading that chapter, I'm gonna be more in the mindset of reading a deployed sailor's eval because they're not at home station very much at all. Hopefully that makes sense. And then here's an opinion note. And I see this all the time as well. So an assistant, to anybody should be a subordinate rank. And I see it all the time in AP, ALPOs. Again, my opinion only. Some would argue that there's no such thing as an ALPO. I would argue that an ALPO is good as long as it's a first class, second class kind of situation or a second class, third class kind of situation. The reason for this in any assistant position is 
all of these evals are gonna be grouped together and read together at some point, right? So if you've got two first classes, this one's the LPO and this one is the AOPO, and they're both claiming the same stats, who do I give credit to? And in, in reality, it kind of discredits that whole command because you're trying to, to jam two sailors and they're claiming the same stuff. So in my opinion, subordinate ranks should only be the assistants. The exception to that rule, and I guess it's not necessarily an assistant as much as it is a co. So if you've got co-chairs of like the Navy Bowl or co-chairs of you know some kind of ceremony, that's okay because it's two people tackling the same problem or the same um, event, that's fine. But if you've got an assistant position, please make sure that they're of different ranks. Okay, next. Here's, a, here's gonna be my first C story, I think. So this is a great way to illustrate how we utilize Block 29 effectively. Several years ago, I had a sailor that I personally knew. They were in my a subordinate command of my larger command. And this sailor was amazing. They were deeply involved in the first class Petty Officers Association. They were at all of the events, working in the um, EAP, fantastic at their job, just all over the place. One of those fantastic sailors, a junior first class that was already you know, up for chief, are gonna be up for chief. So I was very excited to get their evals. So of course I had this person send me their, their last five evals uh, and you know I read over those, bleed all over them and then set up the hour long meeting. So I sit down to read this person's evals and of course they're a, a relatively young first class. So I'm looking at second class evals, not a big deal. You know, it's, it's kind of what happens when you've got somebody making rank very quickly. Well, uh, second class eval block 29 said CPR instructor trainer flip it over on the back and there's three or four lines and I kind of paraphrased here on the right hand side in this green box. They were a CPR instructor trainer. It showed how many instructors they trained, how many staff members the instructors trained right and how it affected the hospitals overall readiness how it affected them on their recent inspection. It brought them up uh, to some certain standard. All this incredible data, very, uh, very juicy data, perfect. So I was super excited, off to a great start, right? Flip over to the next eval. And as you see, I'm kind of showing you here visually in these red boxes, it's a copy of the same thing. Now, in this person's evals, subsequent evals, the numbers changed, the data changed, but it was all the same, same three or four lines. This happened over, I think it was either four or five evals. And when the sailor and I added up all of these lines, it was 16 or 17 lines about CPR instructor trainer. That's a whole eval. That's one whole chapter in your five chapter book wasted on telling me the same thing over and over. How much other fantastic stuff that I know that sailor was doing did not make it into any of their evals, right? Any of their chapters, because we kept talking about the same thing. This is where block 29 comes in. So you look at CPR instructor trainer, right? Look at the green one here, CPR instructor trainer, 12 months, boom. You give me that good four, uh, three or four lines, tells me everything about it, perfect. Subsequent evals should be opposite of this. There should be nothing in block 43 about CPR instructor trainer. This is where you utilize block 29 and put what really matters. And I'm, I'm just condensing it here. It might be just a little bit longer than this, but CPR instructor trainer, 52 trained, and then you know the inspection that the hospital has to go through. And I don't even know if that's the right acronym anymore, but, and then whatever the percentage is, you could probably even add 52 trained, you know, and then the next number is 200 staff members, hospital this percent, done. So if I'm writing a spy novel, and in the first chapter, my spy goes to the range and they learn how to shoot and they learn hand-to-hand -hand combat and they learn how to blow things up and they learn how to be a spy, you don't expect to see that information over and over and over again in each chapter, right? You learn it in the first chapter, so you know they've got that skill set. And each chapter after that, you're just telling me how they're utilizing that, right? So it's, 
you know, shooting the bad guys or, or, or rescuing the people that need to be rescued or whatever it is. You'll hear me talking in my speeches all the time and I say, don't take me back to the range. Meaning, don't take me back to that first chapter every single chapter. Block 29, that's what that's for. Just a quick, short little bullet in there that lets me know you're still doing that. You still have those skills. It's still important, but it's not a massive part of taking up that chapter. All right, some other tips. Always consider what job or rank are you applying for and what are those requirements? So if you're a first class up for chief, we're looking for people that can manage people, manage money, manage products, uh, not products, projects, sorry, and, and lead, right? Those are the things that we're looking for. So are there things that are not in the eval that would explain that? And this is where we talk about the split paper drill. And I'll talk about it. It's here on the right-hand side. I'll talk about it in just a second. What I want you to do is ask yourself, what's going in block 44? And is there anything important enough to go in block 43 that would require further explanation? And again, the split paper drill will come into play in just a second. Something that would speak to the requirements of the job uh, that the sailor is applying for. So this is where I kind of came up with you know, the, the um, I made this thing up, the president of the Save a Puppy Foundation. So the split paper drill is this. Whenever you go to send in your brag sheet or request your brag sheets from your sailors, again, don't ever touch anyone's evals without reading the last five and that includes your own. So as you do that, take a clean piece of paper and on the left-hand side, write, you know, number it one to five, and then these are the things that are currently in your evals. Read your evals, oldest to newest, or have your sailors do the same thing and write down the themes, right? So I was a CFL, I was the LPO, I was a CPR instructor, eval one, eval two. Do the same thing all the way down. You're looking to identify trends that are the same, that are becoming repetitive. And on the right-hand side, you and only you can do this, you or by you, I mean the sailor, you know, who's reading that eval, reading those evals, because you're the only one who knows what you were doing during that eval period that was not in those evals. So you write down the things that, that you were doing during that period that did not make it into the eval or that didn't get the credit that you felt they should have in those evals. Now, if you've got a new sailor on board or, or whatever, a lot of times you can't affect one, two, or three because it's so far in the past. But around four and five, you should start asking those sailors, you know, over here, hey, what does this mean, right? So I've got two examples. Uh, this one here, the Boys and Girls Club, is a, is a very real example, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the President Save a Puppy Foundation, uh, 150 hours. And this is the one that I made up. The one I didn't make up was up here, Surf Rider, five hours. So when I was a young sailor, you know, I was a volunteer for the Surf Rider Foundation, would go out of the, to the beach, you know, I think once a month, we'd pick up trash and that was it. So block uh, 44 is Surf Rider Foundation, you know, 10 hours, 15 hours, whatever. Very objective, very cut and dry, volunteer service done, you know, made me feel good, uh, was a part of what I believe in. As opposed to this sailor here, number five, President Save a Puppy Foundation. This is the kind of stuff you need to be asking your sailors. Hey, what is this? This is where you're gonna catch the sailor who says, oh, well, you know, um, I'm the president of, of the, you know, Save a Puppy Foundation and, and uh, well, we've got a brick and mortar facility. You know, we manage, uh, I've got about 150 volunteers. We saved 2000 animals last year. And I don't know, I think I manage a couple hundred thousand dollar budget. Okay. If you were to break that down, right, you're talking about responsibility, you're talking about financial management, fiscal responsibility, you're talking about leadership, on top of the community relations and all the good volunteer stuff that you're doing, right? These are all qualities or requirements that we're looking for for the job of chief petty officer. So instead of telling me about CPR instructor trainer for the fifth time, this is where you pull in something that maybe is a little bit unorthodox but it explains more of the character in that story. I don't need to know that four lines of the CPR again and again and again. Tell me things I don't know that speak to the requirements for the job I'm trying to hire them for. 
And the Boys and Girls Club thing, you know, I had a sailor again several years ago. I was sitting with a first class petty officer. This sailor was at a command where there were very few sailors, and it was a very, very technical job. And I'm, I'm sad to say that it looked like this sailor's evals, like they had a block 43 rubber stamp and they would stamp it. And this sailor was at the command for four years in a row. They would stamp every eval and just fill in new numbers for that eval. And when I was sitting down having this conversation with the sailor, I saw the Boys and Girls Club thing in there or something similar to that in their volunteer service. And it was a lot of hours and I asked them about it. And they said, I was more proud of that than anything else I did at that command. And they tried to get it into their evals, but their command just wouldn't do it. And sometimes those are the roadblocks you, you, know, you face. But if you're armed with this information and you say, hey, this is why I want to put this in there, instead of having the same information over and over, sometimes you have to help educate you know, people that are writing your evals as well. Like, hey, have you read my last five evals in a row? We're saying the same thing over and over and over. We've got to tell the other parts of my story that, that are not being told right now. So that's why this drill, I think, is super important to do. The other thing that sometimes it help, helps with is every once in a while, you know, we've got sailors that, that think they're doing way more than they are. And so if you have them do this drill and they really get into some good self-reflection, sometimes they'll come back to you and say, wow, I really thought I was doing more than, than I was. But when I started putting it down on paper and looking at my own evals, I realized I need to step up my game a little. So sometimes it can help with that as well. Okay, think about assumptions made by the reader. Uh, here's another quick uh, C story. So if we see, you know, when I'm reading an eval and I see coach of a youth soccer team, I naturally assume that you're a parent of your child that plays soccer and you're coaching the team. Still volunteer service, still a great thing to do, but it's a natural assumption that we make. You're already there, so you're gonna volunteer, it counts, everything works out, right? So I had a sailor that I was sitting with. They were involved in the Boy Scouts or Eagle Scouts, I can't remember which, but they had this great three or four lines written about, you know, teaching the future leaders of America, uh, responsibility, all this stuff. And they only had it in one eval, so that was awesome. They told that part of their character. But I said to them after I read it, I said, this is fantastic, well-written, perfect, not duplicative anywhere else, love it. How long has your son been in Scouts? And the sailor said, wow, I don't have a son. So if you think about that, my natural assumption was that they had a son and that's why they were doing it. But it makes the story even more impactful for that character, right? The fact that they didn't have a son, they were doing it because they truly believed in it. Now, I don't know how you would get that into an eval without it being kind of weird, but the point is paint the best picture of the character for that story that you possibly can. Try to take those things into consideration. What is the reader going to naturally assume? And is there a way to kind of angle the real details of that character into the story if possible? Um, oh, if the sailor is filling the next senior billet, gosh, I cannot, I cannot emphasize this enough. So you see that first class petty officer or that chief petty officer, you know, the first class that's filling in is the LCPO or the chief that's filling in is the senior enlisted leader, the E8 billet. Please, 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 I beg you, put down the amount of time that they've been filling that billet and all of the things they accomplished while sitting in that seat, right? Quantify what they're doing. Because, I mean, what speaks to the board louder than, hey, this person has been the acting chief for 11 months or for the whole year or for four months, whatever it is, and they crushed it. Look at the results that their sailors had when they were acting as the chief. You made our job on the board even easier. Like, wow, we got a test run on this sailor. They're already proven that they can be a chief. Boom. Please quantify those results. Make sure you're discussing that. Put it up in block 29. If you're the LCPO or your sailor is the LCPO acting as an E6, put LCPO in there and really explain it. Okay, I'll get off the get off my soapbox on that one. Uh, could someone who doesn't really know what you do understand your job in a basic terms based on the eval? This is very important because when you're sitting a panel, whether it's you know in the Corman rating, we're all Corman, but we have so many NECs that 
it's almost like they're separate rates. And in other panels, you are sitting separate rates, right? So you've got to write well enough not to explain it in great detail because we just don't have the space to do that. Your goal should be to make it important enough to the reader to find the subject matter expert if they really don't know. So the, the basic Navy stuff, easy day, all sailors know that, not a big deal. You know, if they're the, the CAICO or the sponsor coordinator or whatever it is, we all know that stuff. But if it's something rate specific or very technical, make sure that you write it well enough that if I don't know, I turn to that subject matter expert and say, hey, can you come over here and explain this? Because it sounds important, but I'm not sure. Um, and I, I do that by, you know, when I was coming up, giving it to somebody who's not in the Navy or not in my rate and saying, hey, can you read this and give me a general idea of what I do? And if they say, yes, I know I'm in the ballpark. If they say, no, I have no idea, I need to go back and reconsider uh, what I've written. Let's see. Why are associations important? Okay, especially for first classes, right? Or, you know, second classes that are in, you know, as you move up. There's no secret. What makes the Chiefs Mess so strong is our network. So if you're in associations, and I define associations, again, my opinion, right? I define associations as anything outside of your normal, like, job scope. So, of course, the FCPOA or SCPOA or any of that, MWR or uh, any kind of association that you can get into that shows you play well with others and are learning to network at a young age. Associations are helping build that networking skill so that, you know, it, it, it just furthers the ability of us to help our sailors because we don't know everything, right? But the bigger, stronger network you build just means that when a sailor comes to you with a problem, it's okay to say, you know what, I don't know, but I do know who knows that, or I do know who deals with that all the time. Sit tight, let me give this person a, a call and we'll get it figured out and get you helped. That's what the associations are meant to do, aside from community service and all that other good stuff, but that's what the real foundation is. And so being in associations on a board shows us that you are already starting to do that. And personally, it just helps you grow as a sailor and build your leadership skills. College and no college, I'll try not to get on a soapbox and just be very quick with this. Um, does it have an impact on your evals? Sure, probably a little, you know, advancement stuff. Yeah, it gives you points on the, you know, on the advancement exam as you're coming up. But really, college is all about you. And it's setting a good example for your sailors, but it's about you. Please, I don't care if you stay in for four years or 30, get your college, do not leave the Navy without a degree because as I know, getting ready to go over the side in a couple months, all of this stuff ends at some point or another. College is all about you. Please get it knocked out. Um, start early and don't stop until you've got it. Okay, off my soapbox on that one. White space or no white space? <laughs> Kill the fluff, okay? And this is one of my favorite quotes. The road to hell is paved in adverbs. Stephen King said that. Another big uh, error I see in eval writing is, is just purple prose or super fluffy writing or you know, whatever you want to call it, right? But a big question that people always ask is, well, again, and if you ask 10 people who've sat aboard, you're going to get 20 different answers. This is one of those areas because I will tell you, sure, I like white space, but I'm also super down with reading from here to here, you know, all every line filled if it's all good information. I think what all board members would agree upon, don't waste our time with crazy fluffy words or you know, a lot of big adverbs and all that kind of stuff. We don't need it. We know what those things mean. Give us the, give us the statistics, give us the meat and potatoes, give us all the stuff that we need to know to paint the accurate picture of your character. Another great tool is when you, you know, write your draft that you're going to submit or you're reading someone else's or whatever, read it out loud. And if you get bored listening to yourself as you read it, it's probably too fluffy. Go back in and start cutting words out. And this is where you go back and look at block 29. If you're repeating words that you've already used in 29, short of, you know, like LPO to show that, hey, I'm gonna give you my sailorization stats, cut all that stuff out of there. Okay, openers. Um, openers, closers, all of this stuff is extremely important and it helps set the scene for that chapter as well. If you, uh, have been messing with the you know performance trait average to to 
get those individual trade averages to match, you know, where we need that sailor to fall out for Risca, for the CO or something like that. It's okay to open with resetting my Risca. That lets us as the reader know that's why the marks have gone down or that's why, you know, the, the individual trade average is, is lower than it, it probably should be or something like that. Stuck in traffic. We see that a lot for sailors that have been in a command for a couple of years. Maybe they got the welcome aboard P, then they got an MP, and then maybe they got a, a rated MP or a second MP, but they're still not, you know, really climbing the ladder. But you say stuck in traffic in a large command, that just helps us understand that would be EP if not for forced distribution, same kind of thing, right? We understand those, just take the time to kind of give us a quick bullet to explain it. Uh, sailor of the year, you know, that's the kind of stuff you wanna also see in the opener, like open that. Hey, this is something significant that this sailor did. We want you to know it, don't forget this. My big takeaway here is don't be disingenuous in anything you write, please. And I'll try not to get on off on a tangent or on a rant about writing truthfully, you know, uh, and I say down here at the, at the next bullet, tell the truth. So, you know, openers and closers, we kind of see like these rubber stamp comments, promote immediately, make him a chief now, uh, she's the best thing that walks on water. Those comments are great if they're truthful, but if they're not, these are often the reasons we're all doing the, the two-handed salute when the board results come out and he made it and she didn't. And we all know that he's not a great worker and she's amazing. It's because things in the eval were not, not written truthfully or not written to best reflect what that sailor's real performance was. On the board, all we see are evals and are, you know the, the package and stuff. So that's it. That's all we have to go off. So please make sure you're writing truthfully. When I say don't be disingenuous, and this is a pet peeve of mine, again, all this is my opinion, right? So it's always, it's always makes me chuckle when I see a, a second class petty officer promoted to first class petty officer, and immediately it says, you know, make her a chief now. We can't make her a chief. She's a fraught first class petty officer. That makes me question everything I've read previous to that. It's okay to say, you know, she's already crushing it, Gun, going to be an amazing chief or, you know, promote as soon as she's eligible. Things that let me know you're not, you're not just like rubber stamp of comments down there. And this is where I'll also say that, you know, in, in, the, in the more junior ranks, you'll see promote to first class petty officer now. Well, in the past, it made me chuckle because really there's no opportunity for that. You have to take a test to promote with the exception of a rare few, but now MAP has changed that. So I will say, if you've got those extraordinary sailors, save those silver bullets for them. How about a comment that says, if you've only got one map quota, this is the sailor to spend it on. Those are super powerful closers, especially if you only see it in a group of, you know, from that command, if you only see it on that one or two sailors. Because then, even if they're not promoted on map or weren't promoted on map, later when we're looking at them for chief, and we're reading those evals, we're like, wow, this sailor was already getting called out, you know, back then. So please just be, uh, be genuine in your comments. Uh, tell the truth, you know, I, I think I just talked about that. What's an air gap? So an air gap is one of these things and it's often called the, the velvet dagger as well. You've got a great write-up, you know, say on a transfer eval, great write-up or, or kind of a good write-up. And, you know, you've got that sailor who is a P, a P, maybe an MP, and then on their, their transfer eval, they're a one of one EP all of a sudden. Uh, that's, you know, sometimes we see those, but there's also the ones where when they transfer out, they could have been an EP and they're not, they're an MP, they're a one of one. So an air gap is technically when somebody is a one of one and they're not maxed out as much as they could be. We call that the velvet dagger because if they've got like a decent write-up, enough to make the sailor think, oh, I got a good write-up, and then they're an MP, people think that's sending a signal to the board to say, don't promote this person. My personal belief is if you feel that strongly that that sailor should not be promoted, then just write them an eval that, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, that, that they, it should say don't promote them or whatever, unless there are significant problems, which is a whole other video, right? But I guess just truthfully depict that sailor's performance. 
And none of this should ever be a surprise to a sailor. The eval a sailor is getting should never be a surprise to them because if we're doing things right, <laughs> excuse me, sailors should be counseled all along the way so that when they get that eval, they know exactly what to expect. Hold on one second. Okay. Final slide. We'll talk about the board package for just a minute. So whenever I look at a board package, the first thing I ask when I'm looking at the documents is why are you submitting this document and I'll hold up one. My point in that is everything you submit to the board, you should be able to explain to yourself or anyone who asks, this is why I'm submitting this. So I'm submitting that award because it's not in my OMPF and the board needs to see it. Perfect, right? But if you're just submitting things because someone told you to submit it, you have to question that. Um, certificates versus 887s or and 887s, I should say, or 888s, whichever one it is. Uh, to me, that's duplicative, right? So if you're submitting the, the 887 and it's got all of your JPME requirements done, why are you also submitting the certificates? I'm, I'm having to look at both. So I would recommend it's one or the other. Now, huge myth is that, you know, we're all sitting there judging you based on how much you submit to the board. That's not the case. And this is where I always tell people, if somebody told you to submit your last eval into your board package, even if it's in your OMPF, and that helps you sleep at night, then by all means submit it. You're not being judged based on the thickness of your package. Uh, it's We're still going to give you all the same due diligence, right? But as a, as a person who's wanting to put their best foot forward, I would encourage you to really sit down and diligently look at your package and say, okay, I'm submitting this document because of X and so on and so forth. Career summary. So here we go. This is another one of those that if you ask 10 people, you get 20 answers. So in my analogy of a novel, the career summary is like your table of contents for your novel. It is not official, 100%. It is not an official document, but that's okay. I've only met a couple of folks that have sat the board that just absolutely hate them. Everyone else, you know, is kind of in between one way or the other. I personally love them, and I'll tell you why. To me, it's your safety net, right? So, um, and, and hold on, before I get to that, let me go down here. So, no more than one page, right? And what would you be sad if I missed while reading all of your, your information, your package, right? Your evals, your awards, all that. What would you be sad if I missed and add the dates? So when I say one page, no more than one page and add the dates, look at the things again that are absolutely pertinent to the requirements for the job you're applying for. So for a first class going up for chief, what are the things that I feel that board member, that reader should absolutely know about me to make sure that, you know, that they don't miss? So that's where I go back up and say it's your safety net. So the way I grade, I read everything else first in your, in your, you know, your, uh, uh, your record. The last thing I look at is your table of contents. To me, this is your safety net. This is you speaking directly to me saying, Master Chief, please don't miss these things. So what I do is, you know, I've kind of got my grading sheet over here and I look at the career summary and I say, you know, LPO in charge of this many people these dates. Yep. Got it. Got it. Got it. Oh, hey, wait a minute. I didn't see this award. Now, does that mean I count that award? No. But again, table of contents. Wow. They got a Navy comm, you know, uh, at USS whatever on this date. Hmm, I didn't see that. Then I'll go flipping back through your record. Right? And I do this, even though it's digital. So I go flipping back to your record and I find that date. I find that comment. I'm like, oh, okay, great. Glad I didn't miss that. Hopefully that makes sense to you. It's your safety net of the things you think that I absolutely should not miss. Other folks that I've talked to go the opposite way. It's the first thing they look at. And then, you know, some folks will just kind of read it and, you know, they're the ones that generally kind of hate them. But I would say 80% of people find them useful. I love them. End of tour awards. Uh, so end of tour awards are like, to me, they're like an epilogue in a novel, right? So you read the novel uh, and our spy novel, let's say, you know, our, our spy, uh, you know, 
gets the bad guy, saves the world, and sails off into the sunset with the love of their life. Well, the epilogue is meant to tell us things that we didn't get in the normal part of the story. So after we finish the final chapter and it's got an epilogue, we look and say, oh, wow, when they sailed off with the love of their life, you know, we find out that person ended up being another bad guy and, and now it's a whole new thing started or, or whatever. It's, it's information we didn't already have in the previous story. What we see most of the time with End of Tours is literally a summary of everything that was in the previous probably three chapters, you know, those three years that you spent at that command. Now, I understand that there are some commands that that's what they require. If you're going to get an end tour, it's got to be a summary. Okay. What I'm telling you is you've got two opportunities to, to, you know, tell different parts of the story. So if they're telling you to get this EOT through, you've got to tell us a summary of the last three years, then by all means, write it because the end of tour is important, but then go crazy on that last eval on the transfer eval, go nuts. Tell us all kinds of stuff that we didn't know. Right. Or if you can get it into the end of tour, depending on what your command will let you do, do that. My point is, uh, that's another part of the story. So let's look at everything in total. You got your table of contents for the career summary. That's a part of your board package, right? You've got a letter to the board, which you can tell certain things if you want, and that's board package step. But in the analogy of our novel with our evals going kind of back a step, you've got five chapters, and then you've potentially got your awards uh, you know, from probably one or two commands, depending on where you fall uh, with that particular board, to let us know. So in that, in that frame, you've got a certain amount of space. You've got four lines in block 29 and uh, 17, I think it is, in block 43, two more in block 44 for volunteer service, for education, for, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then Obviously, the Chiefs don't have that last block there. And then you've got, you know, end of tours. So my plea to you is don't ever touch anyone's eval without reading their last four. Read it like a story and ask yourself, where is the character in this story? Where, is their, where are they in their development? How can we develop them more to tell the full story to the person that's reading it? I hope this has been helpful. And uh, I look forward to all the success that, that you all are gonna have in the future. And I uh, thank you for listening and for watching, all right?